So in 1973, uh, a woman changed her name to Peace Pilgrim and began a miss mission where she trekked across the United States on, on foot with only a sweater that said Peace Pilgrim embroidered in it and some letters and her toothbrush. And she walked until she was offered a place to stay and she fasted until she was offered food. And if you haven't read about Peace Pilgrim, it's really worth it. There's an online free PDF of her whole life. But for the next 20 plus years, she traversed the US back and forth. She did it seven times. I think the longest she fasted um, on the road without being given a place, uh, a meal was three or four days. Um, although at one point she did a 40 day fast, but that was in, in one location. And she kept her mind on God the whole time she was Christian. And her story and uh, path were so inspiring. She was arrested numerous times, and by the end of her day in the uh, prison or the, the jail where they put her, um, she had everyone in her cell singing hymns together. And then eventually they, they just released her because she was so nice and the governor gave her a pardon. Uh, there was no real reason to put her in jail anyways. They just didn't know what to do with this woman walking across the state with nothing. And her whole life was dedicated to this. And the strength of heart she displayed doing what in our monastic tradition we call tudong, which means to wander on faith, to walk on faith, was truly astounding. She's one of the great American saints, and we don't know about her, or many don't. And in our monastic tradition, as many of you know, we can't touch money. Uh, we can't ask for anything except for water, unless we're sick or have been invited to. And every day, we can't store food. So the Buddha established this institution on what seem, on the surface, to be unbelievably impractical, imp impractical grounds. How does he expect an institution of monastics who can't support themselves, can't ask for anything, can't touch money, can't store food, to survive? And yet, the Sangha, apart from the Jain monastic order, is humanity's oldest institution. And its longevity over 2,500 years is one of the most profound testaments to humanity's kindness and the goodness that rests at the heart and the common thread that binds the rise and fall of empires and the creation and dissolution of cultures, that quiet thread of kindness and faith in a deeper awakening. The Sangha's existence through all that is a great testament to what lies at the center of the human heart. When I was in Australia, we, my first time going to Dong, which is where we just walk out of the door on faith with nothing but our bowls and our robes, and hope that people will feed us, um, that we'll find a place to sleep. Often it's just on the side of the road. But the monk I was going with named Tan Panya, he had a dream the night before we left. And he said, in the dream, Nisipo, I was skydiving off of a, or base jumping, I guess, off of a building. And monks don't do this often. Uh, <laughs> so I think it was a dream. Um, and the first time I jumped from the very top and released the parachute and I had enough time for it to catch my fall and to land gently on the ground. The second time I jumped from halfway down the building and my parachute barely had time to open and I hit the ground hard. And the third time I jumped from even a few floors lower and my parachute didn't have time to open and I 
woke up. And sometimes taking the highest jump is safest. Sometimes the only way you intuit what goodness exists in the world to catch you is by taking a complete leap of faith and giving it a chance to. And this ethic of surrender, it's astounding how when you give yourself to it whilst walking in line with Dhamma, while keeping good sila, morality, while keeping a purpose of awakening in mind, how the world rises to answer you. We didn't know if it would work just to go downtown on alms round every day in Seattle. And the first day I went, seven people offered food. There's been days where people uh, didn't bring quite enough food and that's fine, you know. It's part of going on alms round is you just take what you get. But I remember that day, I was like, okay, well, I guess this is a hungry day, um, that specific one. And as I was walking back, a homeless man came out of an alleyway with a big box of 30 protein bars. And he said, here. And I said, that's really weird. That has never happened before. <laughs> so the goodness of the world answers in ways we wouldn't expect. In Australia, one of my favorite lines we received on Tudong, or on Alms Round, was a tradey uh, driving by in a truck, and he said, we'd walked with bare feet there, and he said, no sandals. Even Jesus wore sandals. <laughs> in Idaho, my favorite line was these two guys drove by in a truck, and they're like, hail Buddha, and I was like, absolutely. The first time Ajahn Kovilo and I went walk Tudong, we were walking from north of San Francisco to Abayagiri, and we're just offered food um, most mornings. And some days you don't get as much. Uh, we had a monk named Tan Pumuto who walked on faith for three years running, and you just wait outside of stores. You can't ask for anything, so you just have to hope that people approach you. And it, it's magical how people are interested and they do ask. And he said, at the end of these three years, and he was, he was well fed, he got enough. He said, what I found out was giving is not predictable, but it's reliable. And it's funny, whenever I've tried to kind of cheat the universe in that way, I think on one of these tudongs, I'd been uh, walking many, many kilometers the previous day, and I was really hungry, and I saw a Thai restaurant, and I'm like, the Thai people. So I carefully, slowly walked in front of the Thai restaurant. And then I slowly walked back. I just kept going. And the universe wasn't having it. You know, you can't cheat it. So I think that day I got an apple and a Pepsi, but from some random, random person. And it was a hungry day, but it's OK. And the next day, I was waiting and being a good monk and just waiting you know, on the street, truly having faith. and. Uh, four teenage girls came up, and they just had a sleepover and had a bunch of leftover pizza. And that was my meal. Kindness hides in the strangest places. So when we speak about renunciation in Buddhism, part of it is this ethic of surrender. Part of it is an ethic of simplicity, simplifying our lives by giving up what we do not need. Part of it is developing patience. And part of it is just realizing that we're not as vulnerable as we think. That if some of the things we're so attached to go, we'll still have a place to sleep. That in some sense we're unshakable if we have our refuge in the Triple Gem. And the Buddha gave a list of, uh, there's a list of 13 practices in the Visuddhimagga, an uh, ancient text called the Path to Purification, called the Dutangas, which uh, means to wear away. They're these wearing away of defilements. And they're these practices the Buddha gave or allowed the monastics to kind of shake off the dust. They let you add an edge to your practice. They let you develop these qualities of patience, of determination, of surrender, and of faith in the goodness of the world around you. 
And, you know, before going into this, uh, I think every monastery I've been at, you usually have at least one monk who's just really doubling down. He's decided not to speak to anyone for three months, is fasting every other day. Maybe he hasn't slept in a month, and I've been that monk, and it's pretty miserable. Um, and often it comes from a place of aversion or uh, violence. And you want to be careful if any of these practices begin to be flavored with that uh, note of violence, of, um, of something unwholesome. Uh, some of them have to do with food, and if you have eating disorders, you need to be careful with that as well. But if one takes a playful attitude, these are really useful practices to shake off the dust, to make things a little bit fun, to have a good time uh, with practice in a weird sense. Um, I have been, you know, the monk uh, giving himself to these practice in an unwholesome ways, but I've also found them to be very useful if used correctly. So the first of these practices uh, of the 13 is the rag robe wearer's practice. And this is uh, in the time of the Buddha, robe was quite expensive, uh, cloth was rare. So monastics would go to a charnel ground and take the cloth left in the trees, um, or sorry, left from wrapping corpses and they would unwrap the cloth and boil it and try to get it to not smell, and they would make their robes out of it. My robe is not made out of that cloth, but uh, it's very hard to find corpse cloth these days. <laughs> Long Porpasano managed to find some back at Wat Pananachat, and he said, yeah, we really tried to make it not smell, and it's pretty impossible. So, but it's this beautiful recollection of, it's just cloth to cover the body. It was wrapping one corpse, now it's wrapping another. This one just happens to be a little more mobile at the moment. And it's a reminder of death, of the preciousness of life. I would not necessarily push this one on lay people. The second is the triple robe wears practice. And this is where you determine just to have three robes. Um, and this is what we hold as forest monks. We have our outer robe, our lower, and then I've got a special double layered robe, which I don't have with me right now. But the Buddha said this was enough. And this ethic of contentment with little, of not paying too much attention to how we look or adorn ourselves is very much transferable to a lay life. Can we just get our outfit for the week? Can we settle on something that's simple, good, um, and also appreciate uh, contentment with enough. Whenever we get a new piece of cloth as a monastic um, or a new requisite, we have to determine it. Um, so what we have to do is first we have to discolor it. So usually we'll put three little dots, we call them bindus, um, to sort of make it look less pretty. Um, although monks come up with really ex kind of interesting bindus, which sort of defeats the point, but You've got to let us have some fun, I guess. And then you determine the cloth. You say, I determine this as uh, a piece of spare cloth three times. Idang parakala chalang aditami. Idang parakala chalang aditami. And you invoke the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha beforehand. And this ethic of really remembering what it means to take possession of something and to not just have that be half hearted. If you did that for every item that arrives from Amazon, would you order as much from Amazon? <laughs> so whenever you get a new piece of clothing, you know, can you take that second to say, I'm determining this as one of these requisites just to cover the body, just for the sake of modesty. And then when you relinquish a piece, we have to do the same thing, we relinquish it. Idang parekala chalang puchudarami, I relinquish this. And just really taking stock of what we take in and what we put out. This ethic of minimalism, of enough. The Buddha uh, has this phrase very often of he says, we use requisites, food, cloth, lodging, medicine, only for the sake of, 
only for the sake of, uh, for cloth, only for the sake of covering this body. And as monastics, when we ordain, we have to be content. We're, when we ordain, we have to agree to be content just with rag, uh, leftover cloth. We have to be content with just the scraps of food given to us, um, only for the sake of nourishing this body. We have to be content just with the roots of trees as our dwelling places, just for the sake of shelter. And for medicine, we have to be content with fermented cow's urine, which apparently was a thing. So <laughs> I, I haven't tried it. But can we take on this ethic of enough? And one way I've really seen this done in a lay life is you determine the number of material possessions you have and cap it. And whenever you get something new, you have to give something away. And what this leads over the years is that each thing becomes precious in, in, a, in the best possible sense, infused with meaning. Because you only get so many, 500 items, 100 items, or 100 is a little too few perhaps, but 1,000. How many items can you cut down to and can you cap? There's a monk in, or a priest I believe, a, a Buddhist priest in Japan who, whenever he was deciding whether he wanted to uh, get a new item and couldn't decide if he needed it, he'd hold it to his chest and if he felt weak, then he knew that he didn't want it. His body would respond by saying, you don't need this. But if he felt strong or the sense of joy spark, he knew it was an okay item perhaps to take on. So the sense of enough. The next practice is called the uh, alms food eaters practice. And this means for a monk at a monastery, you don't take from the food table, you just take what's given in your bowl. And this is followed by another practice called the house to house practice, which means, you know, if you go on alms round, you get a pretty good picture of which houses give a lot, which give a little. And this was saying, you don't get to skip the houses which give less. You go to every single house until you get enough, and then you turn back. Because you're just accepting food for nourishment of the body and to give people a chance to give. So this ethic of gratitude and of just taking what food is enough for you. And there's ways of cultivating this. Um, one is to really... Uh, Actually, I'm going to add on one here is, uh, well, first, just to recollect with gratitude before you eat. Always, like, where is this coming from? How many people worked to get this onto your plate? What a gift. And also, to try and, you know, you can merge this with one of the following practices, which is the bowls eater practice, which is where you eat everything out of the same bowl, which is what we do as monastics. Um, and you can really spice this up by mixing stuff together. I know monks who have sort of emptied Pepsis into their bowl, and it gets, it gets wild. Um, and this is just to make it kind of one, it's a nourishing mush, and uh, it really helps you let go of some of the attachment and fixation on food, mixing it together. So can you try that? You don't have to do it every meal. Maybe not when you go over to your friends and they're feeding you dinner. But can you make a practice of simplicity and simplifying? Um, mixing your food together or maybe just cook a big, you know, a big thing of curry for the week and just go with that. It's simple. It's good enough. We spend so much time on food. And is it really necessary to give that much attention to it when it's just medicine for the body? And this ethic of gratitude, there's a sutta uh, where Mahakasapa, who's known for his ascetic practices, says, one may approach families with the thought, may they give much, not little. May they give fine things, not shabby things. May they give promptly, not slowly. May they give respectfully, not disrespectfully. Such a monastic is not fit to approach families. 
Or a monastic approaches families with a thought, when amongst others, how could I possibly think, may they give much, not little? How could I possibly think, may they give fine things, not shabby things? How could I possibly think, may they give promptly, not slowly? Such a monastic is fit to approach families. And monks have defilements too, and that line has echoed in my head perhaps more than any other line from the teachings. Whenever you're on alms round and someone gives you something where perhaps you'd like something else, it's the Buddha saying, acknowledge the gift. How many people don't have food? Uh, how beautiful that you do right now. This is just for the sake of, of existing right now, for the sake of practice. And bringing to mind that gratitude every day uh, before you eat. And one really great way of doing this is to give as well before you eat. The Buddha said, if beings knew, as I know, the fruits of giving, they never would eat without first having given. Even if it was their last mouthful, they would not eat before having given some, if there were someone to give it to. But because beings do not know, as I know, the fruits of giving, they eat without having given. Stinginess overcomes their minds. So this is the basis of what they call the Saraniya practice in Sri Lanka, where the monks always give before they eat. Uh, either you drop a piece of food into another monk's bowl, or you know, the Buddha said, even the scraps of rice from your bowl, can you give those to the ants uh, after you're done and think, may this feed these beings? So you don't have to do it before breakfast, but I know people who have taken this on to give something every day to someone, a homeless person on the road, bring cookies to a neighbor, uh, just something can you always give. And over time, your mind shifts, and the first thing you think when you get some new food is, who can I give this to, or a new item, who can I give this to? The next alms food practice uh, is one sitting practice and later offering refusers practice. These are very awkward names. But what that means is the Buddha uh, required his monastics to finish eating before noon so that we weren't constantly walking into town asking for alms from lay people and bothering you. But, um, but he said, I recommend uh, eating once a day. And now that intermittent fasting is super popular, then uh, you know the Buddha once again is proven right and 2,500 years before his time by many a podcast today. So uh, eating once a day is, uh, it is something forest monastics many hold. Ajahn Kovilo and I love this practice because it simplifies. Um, and one doesn't have to do one sitting, but there is something to be said for um, cutting out a meal. And uh, for some people, you know, the Buddha recommended not eating afternoon. And what that does is it just clears the decks of that afternoon. You don't have to prepare dinner. You don't have to worry about, you know, a dinner date. It's time for practice. Um, and in the evening, your mind and heart feel light and buoyant. And you can have some sugary drink or soy milk, or maybe you even want to, you know, hold it a bit more lightly and have some a protein bar or something like that. Um, but can you kind of lighten one of the meals? For some people, breakfast is the one they kind of want to drop. And that's okay too, but it's worth experimenting with. And the Buddha recommended that at least one day a week, one holds the eight precepts. And this is the uposa today practice, is one of the eight precepts is not eating at inappropriate times. And that means you skip dinner. You don't eat afternoon, midday. And one day a week, can you do that? And can you just let people know, you know, this is the day when I practice and I turn off my phone, I don't watch TV, um, you'll have to watch Netflix without me, and I don't worry about dinner. I just, uh, I meditate, I go for a walk with a friend. Um, and there's a, this is what I call the sila of simplicity, the morality of simplicity. This isn't too harsh, it's just simple. And when you do it, you realize it's not actually that bad. It's not that hard. So is it worth experimenting once a, once a week to see what is possible? 
And I'll add on here the practice of fasting, because if you do want to shake it up a little bit, fasting is a very powerful practice. This isn't in the Dutangas, and it is not for everyone. And you have to be careful if you have uh, struggled with eating disorders. But fasting has been a thread of practice through traditions across the world. And I find it's very powerful. Ajin Kovilo and I both try to fast about four days a month, um, sort of once into four days a month at least. Ajin Jayasaro does when he has the chance. And um, you can either fast by cutting off calories completely. Um, that's quite hard and really painful. Uh, at least it can be. But usually that difficulty will last for the first day or two. And for that period, it's helpful to have a friend to do it with so that you have support. Maybe start with just one day um, instead of multiple days. Uh, taking electrolytes and salt is really helpful. But then after day one or two, you'll find the mind and body slip into this smoothness where things are really calm. And you can ride that wave of calm for three or four or five days. Um, and it's interesting to try. I know people who do this while they work. It can be a bit difficult because the mood swings are kind of intense, so be wary. Um, and I have done uh, the one type where you cut off all calories. Um, and after I'd finished, I think it was a seven day, uh, my teacher was like, well, you did it. And I said, I think once was enough. <laughs> So uh, for me, I do think uh, taking a bit of sugar every, um, you know, can be every little bit, can kind of help keep your blood sugar just up enough, and that works better for me. Um, but you can experiment. It's okay to try. Uh, you know, try it for a day, see how it works for you. And you might find there's a real power and calm you can access by giving it a try. And it just shows you you don't need food. That, as much as you thought, you're not as vulnerable if you don't have quite enough to eat, it doesn't matter. And this is one of the reasons we were able to come to Seattle and really trust alms round because if we didn't get enough, it's okay. We've done without before. There's a saying that uh, any fool can fast. It takes a wise man to break a fast well. That's true. So uh, when you start to eat, um, yeah, just being very restrained around uh, beginning to to eat. The next practices all have to do with sleeping. So there's the root dwellers practice, the forest dwellers practice, the open air dwellers practice, the cemetery dwellers practice. And those are just sleeping at the roots of trees in the open air or as the name suggests in a cemetery. I think you will get arrested if you do that these days. I'm not suggesting it necessarily. And um, the final is uh, Nesachika, which means the sitter's practice, which is where you don't lie down. And this pushing sleep, I find if you're good at fasting or fasting works for you, generally pushing sleep might not work for you. Whereas if pushing sleep works for you, fasting really might not work. Um, Long Proposno, for example, when he tries to fast, uh, it, it does terrible things to his stomach. So find what's appropriate if you're gonna experiment with these practices. But in Ajahn Chah monasteries, it's standard that once a week you stay up, uh, you do sitter's practice, which is where you don't lie down. You sleep leaning against a wall for one night um, or don't sleep and just try to meditate through the night. Um, and this is interesting to try is, you know, once a week or once every two weeks, maybe on that uposa today where you haven't had dinner, what would it be like just to stay up uh, all night and listen to a Dharma talk, do walking meditation, take a cold shower, drink a lot of coffee, um, walk, uh, and what you might find is uh, it's much easier to do when you're with people, so doing it with a friend or two is helpful, but you might find you click into these very interesting states and often during the night itself, you won't achieve much calm, but the next day you'll Sometimes, once you've gotten a little bit of sleep, the calm will manifest after the fact, and you'll find these deep states. And some teachers, this is really a helpful practice for them. Long Parpasano uh, did Nessa Chika for months upon months. Um, at Mop John, I've done it with many people for several months running. And you do sleep during the day, leaning against a wall. Um, 
I admit sometimes our meditations in the night were not very inspiring. You sort of, there's a story of Ajahn Brahm trying to stay awake. Um, uh, the abbot had them all place matchboxes on their head so that if they nodded off, it would fall and wake them up. And Ajahn Brahm discovered that he could stick his to his head using bubble gum. Um, and then, uh, but then he woke up to this loud noise and realized it was the sound of his head hitting the floor. So you don't want to go that far. Um, and be very wary the next day of the mood that comes. Uh, they had to stop making this mandatory at, oh no, at Nanachat, they had to make a rule that you couldn't admonish another monk the day after Nesachik because monks were just getting too angry at each other. So just be very delicate the next day. But it's, it's fun to try, and it's uh, useful. A lighter version of this is just this determination. You find when you practice, especially when practice is getting deep, sometimes you don't need as much sleep as you thought, and you'll find yourself waking up at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., and one part of this practice is just determining that when you wake up, you get up. And you can go to bed in an hour, but just get up and start practicing. Longpur Sumedho says this. He says, when it comes to waking up, don't let wisdom anywhere near it. Waking up is an act of faith. So when you open your eyes groggily, you can come up with all sorts of reasons not to get up. But this is the practice, is when you wake up, you get up. Um, splash some cold water in your face. And then if you really are tired, an hour later, you can go back to sleep. And what all these do uh, is just allow you to kind of test your limits a little, shake off the defilements. And if they seem a bit extreme, then know that the Buddha really gave a mild version of these in the eight precepts. This is the sila of simplicity, where he said, one day a week, can you determine to live like the arahants live? Which is, you hold the eight precepts. Um, not killing, not stealing. These are part of the five, which you, you should hold all the time. But for this one day a week, um, can you add, make the third from no sexual misconduct, you change it to no sexual activity whatsoever. The fourth, no lying. The fifth, no intoxicants. Thich Nhat Hanh expands that to entertainment, especially horror movies, no horror movies. Um, but on that day, can you just put aside entertainment, put aside the Netflix, listen to a Dhamma talk, something like that. Uh, not wearing beautification and adornment. Um, not uh, eating at inappropriate times, so just skip a meal in the afternoon or just have a bit of soy milk, something like that. Uh, and then also not sleeping on raised beds. So the idea there is not to indulge in sleep, but really it, uh, if you take it literally and just sleep on a thermarest for that day, it actually makes a difference. If you wake up on a thermarest, you, you realize you're doing something different and it's quite helpful. So the form is not insignificant. And these eight precepts, if you hold them once a week, a reminder, a way to reorient your compass. This is standard practice for, for uh, Buddhists. And it's helpful to know that if you just try to cut things off, sometimes it's quite hard just to lock yourself in a room and do these. So try to build a world around this uposa today. You know, bring other people into it. Maybe the day where you turn your phone off afternoon is the day when you don't just lock yourself in your room, you go for a walk with a spiritual friend. Maybe that morning, you make sure to invite a bunch of people over and feed them a brunch. Um, maybe you meditate with a friend. Uh, make a world of it, nourish it, make it a community thing as much as you can, but also find time for solitude. And this lets you reorient the compass. It lets you not forget the water you swim in the rest of the week. Often you only have so much you can alter day to day. Maybe you only have 20 minutes every morning for meditation. But can you batch your practice? Can you get an extra hour once a week? Can you find a friend who every other week can take the kids and then every other week you take their kids and exchange that time so that you actually have time to bring yourself back to center? And Gandhi would hold one day a week as a day of silence. And that's worth experimenting with too. Um, Ajahn Kovilo calls it noble smilence, 
noble smilance, so don't get too serious around it, but you can speak when you need to, but can you pull back? And all these are ways of just shaking off the dust and of learning to trust. Because what you begin to see is that when you give up even these things which are habitual, which you think you need, I need this much sleep, I need this much food, um, you find that there's a strength of heart that you didn't always realize you had waiting. And often that sense of surrender is something to cultivate over time. And it's kind of magical how the world answers it. One of the stories I really love is uh, there was, um, well, there's so many good Tudong stories, but uh, on one of them, there was a bunch of monks from Wat Pananachat um, walking on Tudong, and they were in central Thailand, or northeast Thailand, about 20 years ago. There's no Western food anywhere. And like young monks or monastics will do, they were like, wouldn't it be great if like a bunch of pizza came out of nowhere? And the next day, this guy drives past in a car and stops and he says, you know, I have this back seat filled with pizza and I was wondering if you'd all want any. Who knows, you might get some pizza if you do this. And uh, there's another great story of, we had two monks walking in Australia and they went through a storm and one of their s socks got soaked um, and torn up. And that's a big deal on Tudong because you start to get blisters and all this. And uh, the next day, at the end of the road, there's a woman waiting with two dry socks. And she said, someone came to me in my dream last night and said I had to come here with dry socks because there'd be some monks coming who needed it. When we've walked Tudong, uh, there's been, I mean, first there's always the f interesting stories. The first place Ajin Kovilo and I, sorry, the second place we camped was a poison uh, oak grove. We didn't realize that until after. But that was a bonding experience. We also had run out of water, and the only place to go um, was this winery, and there was like 16 or 17 Californian, you know, folk just doing a wine tasting when two monks walk in and ask if they had any water. That was a confusing moment for everyone. Uh, other times we've been, you know, walking through this, uh, we just, uh, we'd walked for days and were quite hungry and no one was giving any food. And then these homeless, uh, these two homeless people came and they were the ones who, who offered to us and took care of us. And time and again with this practice, these sound like silly small things, uh, these practices, the eight precepts, giving up these little things, they sound so small, but we take a lot of refuge in our habits and the chance to shake off the dust and to intuit that sometimes you have to jump from the higher floor and give that parachute time to open completely before you realize what these refuges mean. Um, that's a good lesson for us all. So I wish you all the best. Okay, so we have time for some questions. Um, if you have anything you'd like to discuss, just raise your hand and we'll run a mic over to you. If you're on Zoom, you may raise your electronic hand. Uh, feel free to use the restroom. It's just there's one outside. It's kid size, but you're welcome to it. There's one over there too. Uh, and feel free to stand, um, move around a little bit if you want. I know you've been sitting for a long time. That's always okay. Question from Cliff in the back.
or Steve, I can't tell. Steve. Yeah, hi there. Um, could you, uh, this is a really wonderful talk. There's a world of uh, Theravada teachers who are lay people, you know, I'm thinking of Sims and other lay people and they, there's an opportunity to offer Donna to them and it's their kind of livelihood. Can you, I'm trying to say this, can you, it can seem transactional to people, but it's not. I mean, it's offering Dhamma, it's not they're, not, they're not asking to be paid. Can you tease that out, like from the point of view of the offerer, the person offering, what is the Dharma aspect? Oh, <laughs> yes, yeah. I say ho-ho because this is, <laughs> this is just a, such an interesting in realm that Western Buddhism's been trying to figure out. Um, many of you will know the Donna talk. Um, and you'll notice that we don't do it. Um, we just point you to where there, we want to let people know there is a way of donating, but that's, that's really it. Um, but the Buddha was so careful around this. Um, he was once asked, where should I give? And he said, where you are inspired. And um, sometimes I've heard people after giving teaching saying, give so that you don't feel regret. But I don't think that's quite right because it implies that you're in the red. And giving where you feel inspired is different. Um, and from a monastic point of view, this is fairly easy. I mean, Ajahn Amaro's done the calculations and a monk takes as much, about as much money to care for as a Great Dane, they found out. <laughs> Not including healthcare, I assume, but, um, you know, so, so it's very easy to come up here and be like, I really am okay, there's, there's nothing owed here. Um, and everything is truly freely given. And if you're inspired, of course, you can support the project. With lay people who are teaching, um, I'd say that, you know, if it is their livelihood, then people need to, their students need to take that into account if they are hoping that they can continue to teach at that same level. But I'd say it's also a great argument or reason for lay teachers to only give up their normal job if they're able to not exert any pressure on those listening to give Donna. Like we can talk about giving, but you'd want to separate it out from the moment of giving so that they're not connected in that unbeautiful way. And, um, and yeah, I, I, but if a lay teacher is able to really hold that ethic and not make people feel obligated to give and avoid that transactional feel at all, I think that's really precious and that it is something that we have to cultivate as, um, as Western practitioners. Um, people in the West often come to Buddhism because of the meditation and they forget that for this economy of giving, that's not an economy, that's not transactional to exist there has to be that undergirding of generosity and real support. Um, so I'd say, yeah, there's a responsibility on the teacher side to not make any motions towards transaction, but it's also the responsibility of the lay community to, you know, if they want to support the Dhamma, then uh, learning to give and, and making that part of one's practice. And that's something that the Eastern cultures really have cultivated. And there's just a brightness of heart when people give um, that's so precious and it's so, it buoys practice so powerfully and I feel like that is one of the great missing ingredients in Western Buddhism right now. So, Steve, did that help at all? Yeah, can, I maybe I can just follow on that for one aspect. I was interested in, to me, in, in terms of offering Don, I, I always feel like it's like one moment in the 2600 years of the Buddha's dispensation and carrying it on right then. So it's almost like, giving to the future and holding the, the Dharma for a giver. And I was wondering if you could sort of, this seems much bigger than just the, the person and the teacher. Absolutely. Um, there's a very interesting sutta where the Buddha's stepmother, Maha Pajapati, wants to offer a robe to the Buddha. And he says, offer it to the Sangha, uh, meaning any group of four or more monks, that's more merit, it's more goodness. And what I take that to mean is the Buddha saying that giving to the dispensation, to the teachings continuance is more 
powerful than even giving to the Buddha himself. Mm. So it's almost like the body of the Buddha is contained within that institution because it's what's allowed it to continue for 2,500 years past the rise and fall of empires. So yeah, if one can consider when they're giving, this is for the sake of uh, continuing this teaching for other beings, for all beings. That's, that's correct. That's beautiful. Thank you. You have spoken of uh, rapture in previous sessions. What is it about and what does it feel like? So the word is piti, uh, P-I-T-I, it's Pali, not like the English piti. And etymologically, it's derived from uh, the word for drink or refreshment. And usually it in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on breathing, uh, mindfulness of breathing, it follows calming of the body, and it often is associated with images of water pervading a lake, cool water, um, or water being kneaded into a, a ball of bath powder. In other situations, Pitti uh, comes after Pamoja, uh, which is like a broad happiness, a sense of well-being. Um, and it also occurs near uh, Pasadi, which is tranquility of body and mind, um, and before Samadhi, concentration. So all that to say is that um, you have different descriptions of this. Um, many Thai ajans attach the word pity to that moment when the mind's becoming calm and the strange sensations start to occur in the body, like you might feel like your body suddenly expanding very wide, or maybe you won't know if your hands are upside down or right side up, or um, all sorts of weird, you know, you feel a wave through the body, or you start to kind of rock. Um, some say this is rapture. I find that sense of refreshment to be the best image I know of, which is like, if you begin to tap into the breath energy, um, you know, like the chi, um, often you'll sense this kind of nourishing aspect. Uh, it'll feel like it's kind of soaking in. But I think there's a rough analogy or similarity with many practices that bring joy. So metta practice, when you begin doing metta, sometimes you'll feel like, oh, I needed this. Like there's a sense of like drinking it up, like I was so dry. And for me, pitti's that sense of like nourishing, like the sponge getting pervaded with something it needed deeply. And what comes after is sukha, well-being, ease. And sukha is like the person, the sponge is filled with that cool water and it can stay still. So pitti is a sankara, which means it moves. There's a sense of kind of drinking and soaking in. And often it'll occur as a wave in the body. Sukha is like after it's soaked in, there's no need to move anymore. You just can rest in that pervadedness. So the term can be applied in a few ways, but for me, it, a useful way to point to it is that moment in meditation of being nourished, of finding the right object. And it's a really important term because often samadhi practice in the West, we think the goal is just to make ourselves calm. And that can really manifest as this kind of blank numbness. And what we're trying to cultivate is a bright, luminous, joyful calm. And that's different, it's very different. So if you do find yourself calming first, maybe you come to the breath and you just find the mind is kind of blank, try to bring up pity um, by dropping in a thought of loving kindness, like metta. And often you'll not find that when the mind is calm but it lacks rapture, it's like this blank cloth. And if you drop in a bead of golden dye, it pervades out really rapidly and brightens the whole mind. And then the mind can consolidate much, much more quickly than it could otherwise. So that's when you're calm. Just try thinking love. And the echo of that word should be multiplied a hundredfold, tenfold, you know. And, and that sense of drinking it up, that's, that can be pity. The commentaries give the analogy, pity is a man dying of thirst suddenly seeing a pond 
and beginning to drink. Uh, Suka ease is after he's sort of satiated. So something like that. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Moffat. Wait for a mic, though. My, my question is the idea of sort of renunciation of not eating a meal, not sleeping, um, eating the same thing for days. Uh, it, it doesn't um, immediately uh, seem useful to me. Uh, it feels to me like I would be, you know, trying to climb a mountain or achieving something rather, like sort of being attached to being able to do it rather than simplicity being the feeling or outcome of it. And so I guess my question is what, and you, you touched on it, but what is the goal or how does it not become uh, more like an achievement? Yeah, great question. And asceticism is, so easily tied into the ego. I think it's one of the most powerful moments in the Buddhist path is when he realized his ascetic practices weren't working and he had the humility to just be like, not working, I'm gonna have some food. And that relinquishment of pride is so key. Uh, not that he had a great measure of pride, but just it easily winds its way into the ascetic practices. You know, I'd say these are just useful things to experiment if you're interested in them, if they kind of seem like you can come at them from a playful place. Um, you know, because honestly, you know, if you're a monastic in a monastery alone, maybe kind of bored, you know, it can be interesting to push yourself in these ways. But if you're a lay person in the world, juggling work, a family, you know, not eating for four days may not be the best decision for you. And so feeling that out and you know, what's to be lost from skipping dinner one day? See how it is, you know? Like, you might find there's a brightness waiting on the other side of that you didn't expect. Um, and at the very least, like, for example, skipping dinner one day a week or one day every two weeks and maybe just having some soy milk or a protein bar, it's not actually that ascetic, it's, but it is much simpler and it lets you have an excuse to not go to the dinner date or dinner with the family and just be by yourself listening to a Dharma talk or something. Um, that's the sila of simplicity. But so much of the practice is about learning right effort. And absolutely, like, if you sense there's that feeling of violence there, of pride, um, there's always a little pride tied into it. But, like, you know, you can see if there's too much of that, then yeah. And this is why I don't usually talk about the ascetic practices. I think people in the West, renunciation, they can lean too far into it. Where we need to lean so often is community, is giving, is finding these other sources of joy. But these are real parts of the tradition and they can be quite fun. And if you do give up eating for a time or you know, give yourself an afternoon without it, maybe you memorize a sutta instead and you find that the mind becomes quite luminous and bright and nourished just by reciting the suttas, you know? And so it's fun to speak to, but you have your eye on exactly the danger. So yeah, if there's too much of that, then avoiding is good, I think, so. Okay, I hope no one goes off and like, if a bunch of really tired, emaciated people show up next week, we'll know this went horribly wrong.